For those of us, if any of us have not met, my name is Ross Overline. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Scholars of Finance. Um, we're also uh, blessed with the presence of our other co-founder on the line today, Ryan Quinlivan, who you can see on the screen. Hello, Ryan, and welcome. Um, it's good to have you. Thank you to all of us who are joining for the National Speaker Series. We are incredibly fortunate to be joined by Richard Davis, um, the current CEO of Make-A-Wish America and the former chairman and CEO of U.S. Bank. Um, for the first 20 minutes of this, uh, Richard and I will share a discussion centered around leadership in finance. And for the majority of the call, we're going to try a new format. Normally and historically at these speaker series, we do a raise hand function. There's a queue. We call on people one at a time. We're going to have this be more of an open discussion format. So um, we're going to spend more than half of the time together today just in an open conversation, an open Q&A. So um, once we get through, I'll sort of open the floor and anyone can feel free to unmute and just jump in and, and have a conversation, ask Richard questions. This is an, a very rare opportunity to learn from one of the true titans of the industry. Um, if you're able, we encourage you to turn on your camera so you can speak with Richard and the rest of the group here face to face today. Um, and to get us started, I will share a bit more about Richard. Richard has a very long bio and he encouraged me to keep it very short today so we can jump right in. But Richard is an established leader in finance with more than 40 years of experience. He's currently the CEO of Make-A-Wish America. As I mentioned prior to that, was chairman and CEO of US Bank, the fifth largest commercial bank in the United States. Um, Richard served as CEO, COO at US Bank from 2004 to 2006, president from 2004 to 2016, and he took the role as CEO in 2006 and served in that position until 2017. Throughout Richard's career, he's also served on the board of, boards of several for-profit and not-for-profit organizations, including the National American Red Cross, United Way, Mayo Clinic, MasterCard, Dow Chemical. And he's also, as we're so grateful to say, on the advisory board of Scholars of Finance and also a member of our Alpha Fund, a big supporter of our work, which we're incredibly grateful for. Needless to say, Richard's, uh, Richard is a titan in the finance industry and the leadership principles that he's learned throughout his career are invaluable, and we're super excited to share those with everyone here. Um, so, Richard, thank you so much for joining us. It's such a pleasure to have you today. Thank you, Ross. Happy to be here. Um, with that, Richard, let's kick it off with you just sharing your story from how you rose from being a bank teller to being the CEO of one of the largest banks in the world, um, and the values and principles that guided you, and tell us a little bit more about what you're up to today. Thank you, Ross. Hi, everybody. And uh, thanks for being part of this series and part of this organization. It's, it's called Roots of Finance. It's something we think we all knew we needed. We just didn't have a name for it. And now you guys embody something that I think will long live into the future. Um, look, my story is not that interesting. The principles, though, for me was were that I never, ever set any goals. I know your parents would hate this, um, but I always set a direction. And so for me, if I had set goals, I would have been limited by opportunities that I saw into the future that might be different when I get there or new ones come along in the meantime, and I would have been blind to those. And I say that because of all of my colleagues when I was going working at the bank as a young banker and then a young executive, I took more lateral moves than anybody I know. And anyone who knows me would agree, I kept taking lateral moves. That also wasn't strategic, it turned out to be quite um, smart in hindsight, because if you think about foundation building, you know, you build it wide and you build it deep and you do that so you can build it up. And if you're walking by a, in a major city and you see a hole being created for a new building, the further down they're going tells you how high they're going to go because there's a stability that's necessary. So my, my career was always being um, the utility player. Every step of the way, I think anyone I worked for would say, what is it you want to do next? And I'd say, what do you need me to do next? And by following that pattern, I was always taken well care of. I never asked them to read minds, but I made it clear what I what I liked and what I would be utility play. Put me in coach, I'll play whatever position. And then there's a whole lot of good luck that comes along and don't forget that. And when it's all said and done, you're blessed to be lucky and blessed to be surrounded by good people. Those aren't completely independent, but they are often uh, necessary to be successful. So I just worked my way up through the bank because I simply couldn't, I couldn't work and go to school um, I had to work and go to school at the same time. So I started as a bank teller and went to college at night. And eight years later, I got my bachelor's. I'm not well educated in that I didn't go any further than that. I already had two kids by that point in time, but I worked full time and I went to school full time. And um, oddly enough, I got some real benefits of 
adjunct professor educations, because while at first it seemed like I was cheated from the beautiful day, day school that has some remarkable um, professors, um, I was taught by people who came from work too. <laughs> And they were very laymen, and I learned a lot about just how business works by people who are in it every day, uh, probably less book smart, but more practical. So at the end of the day, when I got into a real senior position at the bank, um, and Mike, who I know is on now, and I see my good friend Dan Spiller, they will both attest to the fact that my goal was banking, in my mind, was doing the right thing. It was philanthropy. It was helping people learn a part of their life that they didn't want to be expert in and trusting others to take good care of them, provide them whatever they needed. But I also knew that before I would end my life, that if there was a chance, I would love to do one more thing, which I considered first derivative philanthropy. And uh, when I retired from the bank with no predetermined plans whatsoever, I went out and sought in the marketplace a non-for-profit and Make-A-Wish came along and I'm here, there, but the same token, put myself, expose myself, said I'm ready, whatever comes along, and grabbed it and got lucky with good people. So, Ross, it's not that interesting, but I'll close with this. You guys are the, the GPS generation, but my generation went to, on a trip, and we would go to the Auto Club of America, and we would open up these maps, these huge maps, and we'd take a big, fat yellow marker, and we would draw lines on each day we were driving. We'd start here, we'd end here, the next day we'd go there. And the reason I pointed out is because I knew exactly where I was going, but I knew what I was passing through at the same time. I knew that I was choosing to go through a mountain range or going around a lake or going past some you know, sightseeing possibility. And when I landed, I knew where I was in context to where I'd been and where I was going. And the one thing about GPS is it takes you straight to where you have to go and you have no idea exactly how you got there. You have no idea where you are necessarily. You just know you're at the place you want to be. And without that context, it's kind of like setting a goal versus setting a direction. Go that way and be open to all the possibilities. Make it known that you're willing to do things that are sometimes the most attractive or the most expedient to the way to the top. Build that foundation wide and deep and then your building can be as tall as you want to. So there you go. That was your GPS old man comment for starters. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. I appreciate it. Um, I think there must be a, a new term for GPS generation. Um, I think it works you for me. Dating, you might be dating yourself with that reference. but I have three kids that are your guys' age, so at least I... <laughs> and, they, and they told me when I retired from the bank that, see, you're not as funny as you thought you were, because we don't have to laugh at your jokes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's all right. We'll take it. We'll accept it. We'll yeah. embrace it. Um, I appreciate you diving right into some of your principles. Um, first, I actually want to step back and ask you a quick question um, to the extent that you're able to, to share, um, given the forum. Now you're on, you're on several nonprofit boards and several for-profit boards. Um, what's your experience been like over the last few years, really diving into to board leadership and, and board service? Yeah, so, you know, uh, boards are um, very straightforward. They are the boss to the CEO. And it's kind of funny because when you're the CEO, you're the boss of everybody for 90 days in a row. And then on the 91st day, your bosses all come in at the same time and you're reminded that you work for them. And then they leave and you run the place again for 90 days. But what they do is they provide guidance and they provide a listening ear and they give you a context of maybe a bigger world that you might sometimes lose track of. But no matter for profit or not for profit, the board's fiduciary responsibility is governance. And they need to make sure that everything is done right and done well. And one of the reasons it's so surprising, we've had companies in, you know, in the past generation that have done poorly and done bad things. It's most surprising because there's usually a collection of people, not an individual alone that acts. And usually when enough people are together, the right answer does come forward. It's unusual for a lot of people to do the wrong thing. But you'll pull the string on it, you'll find out that governors in cases where something went wrong, also, we're most responsible for not having been informed. They didn't ask enough questions. They didn't learn enough. So based on what they knew, they were led basically to the conclusion, but they broached, breached their fiduciary responsibility by not asking enough questions. So at the end of the day, Ross, a board is supposed to be curious, ask questions, confirm you know, with intent that things are as good as they seem to be, not just presume they are, and then celebrate with the team the success that occurs and then do it again every 90 days or whatever the cycle might be. In not-for-profit, the mission is, is different because it's not shareholders, but that's the only difference. 
So at the bank, I woke up every morning worrying about the shareholders. And I started at a pyramid where I started with the employee satisfaction, which I thought would imbue great customer satisfaction, which I knew would create amazing shareholder satisfaction. So you can start anywhere on that pyramid. But at the end of the day, shareholders were the engine, the coal in our engine. In a not-for-profit, it's your mission. And it's your ability to accomplish what you promised you would against a backdrop of needing to raise money, needing to raise support, doing it well, governing it properly, and then still celebrating and then doing it again. Same thing, just a little different. Thanks, Richard. Uh, I appreciate the context there. When you talk about a, you know, a board being the, the CEO's boss, a CEO leading an organization for 90 days at a time, and you've already shared some of your leadership principles, I'm wondering what your perspective is on sort of the burden placed on leaders to be strong examples. Do you think there is a greater burden on leaders to be strong examples than the average person? And how have you as a role model, try to step up as a role model and be that example. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I'm gonna twist it first and say, everybody's a leader of themselves. No gimmick, not, I don't mean that to be goofy. Um, you lead yourself and it's how you lead yourself that matters maybe most and, and, and foremost because you can't pretend to be a leader of others if you can't lead yourself. I think you know what I mean, but it's often a mistake where people think by virtue of having people under my responsibility, I'm a leader, even if I don't comport myself in the right way. And this is where that big disconnect comes. So first of all, lead yourself. And that means be healthy and have healthy habits and expect more of yourself than you would anyone else. And, and be patient and be thoughtful and be forgiving to yourself, but expect more from yourself than anyone else and expect that that's going to be evaluated by others at the position of leadership. Second point is way harder to be a leader today than it was, I don't know, 20 years ago. 20 years ago, a business leader was supposed to run the business, deliver to, in this case, the shareholders of the mission, and pretty much job well done. Funny thing, you guys, is leaders, to be a leader, you have to presume there are followers. And in today's world, companies that do the best are the ones that the followers are impressed with and will follow vigorously the leader. So it's a quality of leadership, not a position you hold. And in order for followers to want to be led, they have to believe in you. They need to believe in the mission and they need to see behaviors that align with everything you're saying. So you cannot say one thing and do another. You never could, but you're going to be caught on it more than ever. And as you think about what's happening in the world today with things like social justice and things with things like the COVID world, the leader's position has got to be much more public than it ever was. And Mike, I know you would agree, but you know the CEO role it continues to change and I'm not sure exactly where it should land, but it does call out the fact that you are in a mirrored house or a glass home and you are under the magnifying glass. And it tends therefore to think, well, what about me? How do I look? What did I say? What did I write? Still not important. It's what did they hear? What did it mean? How am I leading? So I'll give you one of my very few principles and that is when, when you get a chance to um, teach somebody something, um, there's different ways to learn. One is people learn with the intent to learn. Good enough, I got that information, I didn't have it before. Then people learn with the intent to teach. And when you lead others, you ask them to learn with both intents so that they can learn, translate, and then teach it back and pay it forward. That's an entirely different form of learning because you have to learn it enough to be able to translate it and send it off. The last one is learn with the intent to learn, teach, and act. The other one is it's not just enough to know it. It's not enough to be appreciative that I'm more educated. Is it going to make me act differently? And so when you lead, you're leading as a teacher with all different intents. And I sometimes start meetings and say, just so you know, guys, this meeting is just, this, this information is just so you know it. You don't have to do anything with it. Or I want you to listen differently and I want you to get this so that let's, before we're done, let's confirm you can translate it. And at the very end, we're gonna talk about something. And by the time we're done, we're gonna go do it. So get ready. This is a different form of, of teaching. But it all comes back to leadership is that if you are not teaching with the intent for people to be led and to give them something to act on, you're really just reading somebody else's script. So be careful. Thanks, Richard. I, I think this notion of having to lead yourself first and making sure that we're learning in order to lead as teachers, as role models, I think it really lands for me personally. And um, even as you're talking, I'm already like planning action items for the next week on 
things th things to learn um, to teach and, and act on more more effectively and more frequently and consistently. Um, I hope everyone else is, is taking some some notes and, and learning as we go too. One of the questions I wanted to ask, speaking of, is leadership right now. Um, yeah. For most of the audience on this call, um, we have an audience of our, our students, our scholars of finance, right, the next generation of finance leaders who are an undergrad, a few of our alumni who just have graduated in the last year or two on the line. Um, and they're not the CEO of a large bank. They're not the CEO of an organization. They might be a leader in an extracurricular. Um, they might be a leader among their friend group, um, but they are going off into or are already in a role as an analyst, uh, right. maybe soon an associate. Um, so I'm curious, what are what's some of the advice you would offer our students on the line for how they can lead right now and how they can grow as leaders right now when they may not have formal leadership? How do they more informally lead and influence? Let's go backwards, unpack that. Um, there's no real such thing as formal leadership. That's hierarchy and that's not earned. That's just given. So informal leadership is harder and it's more rewarding because if you can manage through influence, especially from the side as opposed from above, you've obviously got a pretty good message to convey and people who want to be part of that. So it's if it feels hard, it's supposed to be, but it's going to be the best education to give yourself learning to lead in moments that seem least likely. So think about ethics. I want to go there first. If you guys have done in some of your classes, you've studied some of the ethical breaches that have happened in business over the many past years. And one of the reasons scholars of finance is so impressive is because it's taking a stand saying that that can't happen anymore. And those of us who are in the middle of those organizations won't let it happen. We have a higher bar, higher standard. Do you think about it? Do you actually think that anybody in the rooms, the large rooms of people where bad decisions are made, do you think everybody's bad? Do you think just by coincidence, seven people at WorldCom or seven people at some company that's gone bad. Do you think they all just sat together and said, let's do something bad together? And you know the answer is not true. They're, no one's that good, actually. But there was deference by numbers of people along the way that looked the other way, stayed silent, or didn't act. So my first answer is leadership is the opposite of leadership is not acting when you need to. So leadership is what we talk about, but what's the opposite? Cowardice is what I would call it. But there are people in lots of stories that said, I was very uncomfortable. I knew it wasn't right, but I didn't know what to do about it. Now, I'm not stupid enough to say, well, as an analyst, if you're sitting in a room and the CEO, the CFO, and a few others are starting to decide how to kind of slightly change the numbers because it's not going to hurt anybody and it's going to be otherwise negative, I don't expect you to say, I don't expect Drew or, or Rishi to say, that's wrong. I'm quitting. You guys are a bunch of bad actors. I'm out of here. Um, but what I do expect you to do is believe that the culture of any company, the culture is built around not letting that happen. And when someone says, and wherever you end up working, they'll say things like, there's a, there's a way to convey concerns you have to different parties in the organization. There can be the hotline, there can be the ethics line, there can be a boss you, tr you trust. But staying silent is cowardice and you're by omission of stepping up, you're not leading. So I wanna point out that leadership sounds like actionable items where you create and proact, but it's sometimes the reaction to something that's around you and you should responsibly to do something, but in the context that's reasonable, but always step up. The second thing is when something goes wrong and someone wants to kind of cover it up, um, it's natural humanity to think that I'm gonna cover it up because I'll fix it before. It's like the gambler who just keeps betting until they're out of money and then goes borrows money thinking they can make it back. It never works, you guys. So when something's not going well, it doesn't right itself. And you need to get in the middle of it and, and take some action to fix it. And that's back to another place where even if you're an analyst and you're at the lower position, but you're part of a larger organization, you all have responsibility. Um, and it's important that you know that at the very top of the house, the CEO and CFO are signing on a thing called SOX 404, SOX 404, every single quarter. And they're attesting to everything they know to be true. And what they're really saying is I attest that the culture in my company is such that anyone down the chain that had anything to do with it would also have raised their hand if it weren't true. And that's where they are making the bet that the culture wouldn't let that happen. So when you guys engage in new companies and you see what the culture is, always check for the culture of ethics, look for the ethical behaviors, and much as you may hate it, look for where you would raise your hand if you needed to, because everyone deserves to know that there's a real company that wants to know if something's not going well. 
So Ross, part of the being a leader in an early stage is not what you think it is by saying, I've got to find a place to speak up or I've got to be heard or I've got to raise my hand more. I've got to you know, move faster than my neighbor. That's true in some cases, but as much it's to have a voice and to do what's right every step of the way. You know, the old saying is, you know, if you were at a stoplight and there was nobody around and nobody would get hurt, would you run it? There's no right or wrong answer. Nobody gets hurt and you run it. And there's no one there to catch you. Is it wrong? Some people say, I wouldn't run that light no matter what. Some would say, I won't run it because someone's going to catch me with a camera. And some would say, heck yeah, I'd run it. I'm in a hurry. <laughs> the point is, you need to decide beforehand, where's your line in the sand on things? And so my last point on this is, as a leader where you may be called on, always be ready. So if, and I've seen this before, I've gone on a number of calls in, in my old job uh, with bankers and we would be sitting in the lobby and we're about to go in and meet with a large client. And I have two or three men or women with me. They would be the account relationship managers. They prep me, I've got whatever paperwork. I may or may not know the client. And before we walk on the elevator, I say, here's the deal. So help me to God, if you guys just sit there and watch me talk to the CEO, it will be a bad day for you because I'm counting on you to advocate for the company and tell, introduce me to them, brag about the relationship, say something about them that you know to be important to them, and then let's go from there and then stay in the conversation. No hierarchy, equal voices, equal conversations. And boy, everybody rose to that. But I remember every once in a while I get to somebody who think, well, I'm not prepared for that. Yeah, you are. You know everything. You've got all the data. You know all the information. You know all the players. So look forward to being thrown the ball every once in a while. Be ready when you're least expected to step up and be in a higher position of conversation or authority and revel in it and love it. Because if you find that your psyche is that I'll take that ball when you throw it at me, it's the interception, the guy runs it all the way back. Not the guy who catches it looks like I've never held the ball. What do I do now? Practice and be ready to take it any direction you can and love the fact that you get that opportunity to be, to be in those positions. So all that to say is leadership happens at every step. It happens just as much at the lower level, but it's more reactive than you know. And having a position of what you believe in before that happens is really very valuable to anyone's career. Thanks, Richard. Um, really, I'm feeling really inspired listening to you share this. Um, I'm going to share one quick reaction, one thought, and then yeah. everyone, I'm just going to open it up right now um, just for open Q&A. So um, feel free to just prepare to unmute and jump right in. Um, if people talk over each other, feel free to just politely hand it off and you know we'll, we'll work through all of that uh, and test that format here. Um, but one thought, Richard, that I want to share is when you bring up the stoplight analogy, um, yeah. My my immediate reaction to be fully transparent was yeah. oh, totally. I'm the I'm the latter. I'm like I'm totally not going to wait for that stoplight, <laughs> right? Because um, right, it doesn't hurt anybody. Um, right. But I was thinking about this a couple of years ago, and I think a good rule of thumb to have that sort of can protect us from ethical fading. Yeah. Right. This sort of slow, gradual, even subconscious accumulation of ethical lapses that can lead to larger, really sure. severe ethical lapses. Yeah. Is this this notion of if what I'm about to do, if everyone, if everyone on earth in aggregate did what I'm about to do, what would the world be like? To like take that one little action and say, if 8 billion people did this, sure. This was actually a friend of mine did this to me when I was about to jaywalk. They were like, imagine if everyone just jaywalked, what would the world be like? Times Square. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, like our roads wouldn't function in any metropolitan area. <laughs> Right. Um, and the death rate would be 10, maybe 100x what it is. I have not jaywalked since. I can say that, you know, Scouts Honor or whoever yeah. Scouts Honor is done. Um, so I, that's what I'd offer up as well and, and something I found really helpful. Good, when that Good impulse, observation. Uh, when that impulse comes. Um, with that, everyone, want to open it up to Q&A. We've got over half an hour with Richard. Um, very valuable time. So feel free to just unmute and jump in and, and ask questions and join the conversation. And do it, you guys. Ask questions. Richard, I'll great. Hi, Ryan. I'll start. Thanks for being here. Yeah, nice to see you again. Um, you, you kind of touched on it, but do you have any examples of when a junior or mid-level employee or executive did bring up something to you or something that came to you that you were really glad that they brought up or, you know, maybe oh, the yeah. question this bank was it was solved before it got to you. But for context, the reason I ask is on, I think it was a Northeast panel. One of the panelists had said something to the effect of it, it's a lot easier when you're more senior in your, in your career to not cross the line because you already have status. And when you're younger in your career, you are still trying to climb their ranks. And so you may let things slip or may 
you know, not be right, uh, totally above board. Got it. Ryan, thank you. First of all, that guy's wrong. Um, the higher up you are, the more you feel you have to protect your position. And I think you're less likely in his case to be honest. And what he's saying is when you're young, you're unfiltered and you're just going to say what you think. And that's just completely opposite. The further up you get, the more responsible you are to especially have a responsibility to say something. But that aside, so it was yesterday, I swear to God, don't make anything up, make a wish. We do a thing called skip levels. We didn't do it at the bank, but we do it here, which means that I talk to my direct reports, direct reports at some interval, um, just to have, we call it, they call it coffee chat. Okay, we didn't call it the bank either. So I'm meeting with a fellow named Mark. He's in our revenue team. He's a very, very good guy. Um, I had known him before, but this is a chance to get to know him. What is he, what matters to him, what's the, whatever. And he's, this can't, can't make this up. When I was a banker in Southern California, I ran all of LA and Orange County. And the fellow who ran all of San Diego County, turns out, was his dad. And you can't make that up. And his dad, sadly, is, is soon to pass. And so I can't connect back to him. But anyway, we've made a little bit of familiar catch at that moment. We talked for 30, 45 minutes. And he said, can I tell you something that is risky, but I just think you're going to hate and you need to know. I said, God, yes, Mark. He said, because I, I just trust you. I feel like since you knew my dad, I feel like I can do this. I said, what is it? He said, "There's in my chain of command, everything has to be perfectly choreographed and efficient when they come to you. Everything is completely varnished. And I just don't think you'd like that because I'm, I knew you before a little bit. I know you now, and I think you'd rather just get it, you know, un, unchoreographed and just a little more straightforward. And I said, I, first of all, I trust, trust me. You made the right call. I'm very grateful for that. I said, just give me an example, but don't use a single name. I don't want to know any names. I just want to know. And he gave me a perfect example. And so I am so grateful for that. Um, my impression of him is more to promote him at the next opportunity than not, because he read the moment right. He didn't start out with it. I don't think he was even going to do it until we build a real level of trust and rapport. And then he went in for it because he, he, he presumed I would hate it. And he was right. And I can fix that. And no one will ever know why I'll be more sensitized to it. So there's an example as of yesterday. Now, he did take a risk because if I was a different person, I would either take it straight up to the person or I would have asked, who is that? And I would have gone after him and he would have been in harm's way and all that was risky. But he made the right call. And maybe the lesson in there is do your homework take your calculated risk, but if there's really good leaders in, in your world, trust that they'll be that way all the way through and do what's right. Um, but that's an example and I couldn't make it up because it just happened. Is that helpful? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Do you want to tell me something, Ryan? <laughs> you want to talk about Ross? <laughs> oh, that you'll need at least an hour for Ryan yeah, yeah, I know. to spill dirt on me. Um, Randall, I saw you had your hand up earlier. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah, no. Uh, so, hey, Rudy, thank you for being here, Richard. It's wonderful sure. to see you talk. <laughs> but greetings. I'm Randall Lee Jr., a third year finance administration scholar from Cary, North Carolina. And really, I wanted to understand from your experience when you took the reins of being chairman and CEO of US Bank, and then also in your newer position of CEO of the Make a Wish of America, right. how you kind of like, what was the first thing that you came into the organization and said, this is what I need to change, like about the, the whole organization, or this is what I need to adjust to make sure that the organization operates efficiently into the, the goals or objectives that you set for the organization in the long term? Randall, great question. Thank you. Um, they're different because it make, at U.S. Bank, I rose from different levels to get to the top. So I already knew the organization's mission. I knew that I loved where we were headed, I, all that. But of course, I thought as soon as the boss is gone, there are some things I'd like to change. So in that case, Randall, I went to every board member separately and asked the question, as we make this transition, what are you looking for from me? So I didn't have an opinion that I wanted to sell them yet. I wanted to know what they wanted. If they all come back and said, God, don't change a thing. This place is humming perfectly. Please leave it alone. It wouldn't have changed what I was going to want to do, but it would have changed how I introduced it. If they said, God, you know, there's plenty of room for opportunity and we picked you on purpose because we, we know you're different than the guy before you. 
please feel free to do what you need to do. Then I would have collected that data. Either way, I did that round robin before I made my first salvo to the board that I'd like to make the following few changes. And it's even more nuanced because in most cases, the chairman, the CEO promotes themselves to chairman for a little while for the handoff, and then they eventually leave. So you've got your old boss still hanging in the board while you're trying to decide how much to change. And Mike, I'm looking at you just because you appreciate how challenging that was with me and Jerry. And I took over just before the recession. So there was kind of a twofer. Make a wish is a little different, Randall, but I wanted to point it out because I walked in and didn't have the slightest idea anything about this organization or anything about their goals. I learned everything as I went. But I'll tell you what, my first action was to meet with every single board member <laughs> to find out what they wanted from the organization. And you, you just made me think of it. I never thought of it this way. I did exactly the same thing in both cases. Because first of all, the board is the governor's, the board is my boss, the board has continuity that I might not have had. I wanted to know what they're thinking. And in both cases, it then informed how I would introduce my big plan to make changes or little plan to make changes. And you can well bet that as each of them had had a conversation, the entire team was feeling like it didn't come out of nowhere and that I'd taken the time to hear from them. So one of the best traits, of course, is listening. And that's a good way to prove it is going around and asking people their opinion. In both cases, the same step. Thank you for that. I had not thought of that, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That was a good response. Well, I can ask a question, Ross. I don't know. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm not I'm not moderating now. It's an open discussion. Uh -oh. Everyone just jump in and, um, and ask away. And hey, 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 Ralph. Um so yes, yeah, so I, I covered Richard for a couple of decades when he was bank CEO. And right. um, we did highlight uh, US Bank Corp over the your years when so many bad things were happening in the banking industry. Right. I mean, it was just a, a mess and most banks would have failed and, and your banks did well. So really, I guess, what did you think about your, your, lar your peers during that time? They were taking all sorts of risks. Yeah. Like you say, a lot of people in the room, they weren't all super big risk takers, but like yes. they, didn't, they didn't, they weren't reactive, as you said, they didn't step up, they didn't raise their hand. Um, and so many people were, had that potential to do that. So if you look at your peers during the time that you were bank CEO, how do you, how do you think about that? Good question, Mike. And you and I will share a moment that, that will confirm what I said, what I'm going to say. When we were in the early stages of the recession, Obama had become president and he called all bank CEOs, fat cats. And that, that nomenclature worked for quite a while. And we were called into the White House, I think six or seven times in those few years. And Mike, you do remember the first time we went in, when we were invited to go speak to the public after our first meeting, it was the night after he said fat cats on 60 Minutes, we had a chance to at least provide our views. And only three of us of 12 went out the front door of the West Wing and nine went out the back door. And we called it the perp walk, um, because if you have something to hide, then why aren't you going to confront it? And I remember the dilemma was we were met with the, you know, the, the bevy of, uh, of reporters. Well, what happened in there? And what did you say? And, you know, we, we didn't give away anything that was said, but we did talk about how we feel the obligation and responsibility to do better. Um, and so I did have a feeling that one of the things about leadership is if you really are leading and you take the hill, as you know the phrase, you better turn around and see if the team's with you because you might be taking that hill all by yourself and at the end of the day, you're leading, but there's no one following. And I thought that was quite present in the early days of the recession with the bank CEOs that, that Mike's speaking about. In the end, however, it seemed that as each position effectively changed over to a new leader, there was more permission for that leader to start owning either the history or the circumstances. What really happens is when the music stops and it's indelibly your responsibility, there are two ways to handle it. One is to own it, and the other one is to, to to ignore it and hand it off to someone else. And I think that was one of the most disappointing things that bankers did in that period of time. And I'm speaking particularly 2008 and nine, and I think where you were headed, and I would agree if it's what you meant, we could have completely changed the conversation by the way we had owned it up and that we could have made, I think, some meaningful, visible steps to prove that in this case, TARP money was given that we were gonna make good by it, that we were gonna do well by it, and that we were grateful for it. And there was no place for people to feel that way at that moment in time, and it was a stalemate. 
Um, so for me, I was disappointed in the peers, but at the end of the day, the few that were willing to join you, you, you hang out with you know, that group of kids at school and you become a group of people that at least is destined to do what's right. But it was hard, really hard and, and more lonely than it should have been. But in the end, I, I'm not saying anything else in this call, Ross, after this. In the end, I guess your, your customers were more satisfied, your employees were more satisfied. You made more money by doing the right thing with yes. your stock price. And you had more life satisfaction. Is that a fair summary? All of the above. And I want to say something before we, you and I stop talking. One of the things about these earnings calls is a chance for people like Mike to ask questions. And it sounds like they're asking a question that's technical, like, what will your loan growth be next quarter? Or tell me what your, your fee income broke down last, whatever. But my sense, of Mike, you can confirm this. Mike and the team are actually asking the question to hear the quality of the answer and the tone of the answer. And one of the things that I enjoy with Mike is we would banter like we are here. We wouldn't, I wouldn't read a script or I wouldn't, you know, wonder if I can get the right answer. I say, Mike, all right, you know, we just talk. And, and I remember the one thing I said many, many times, it wasn't just to you, Mike, but you were always there, was if something wasn't very good, I would say, by the way, guys, this wasn't a good quarter or this thing, I'm not pleased, we didn't do well. We dropped the ball, we're late to the party, whatever. And then I would often say, and remember I said that because when we do well, and I want you to believe it, I need you to believe it because I'll also tell you we did well and I'm proud of it. So trying to build a continuum of trust, which says I'll call it when it's bad, but you got to allow it to be good because the tendency is always to believe there's something wrong. And I think that thanks to Mike and, and some of the relationships we had with others, it helped because we didn't hide behind formality, but we became a little more vulnerable. And vulnerable is a real trait to leadership. Um, and it, is, it allows people to believe that you're worth following because you can't lead everything and you can't always be the smartest person in any room. So I, I'll just play it back to you and thank you for that setup. Great, well, thanks for joining uh, this. And, and congratulations everyone on the call and part of Scholars of Finance. I mean, you're, yeah. you're, you're building that foundation that you talked about, you know, going yeah. wide. So good. These guys are making a real difference. Well, in there because I, I, I'll set it up before we're done. Hi, Ross. Hi. Yes, Vanessa. Hi, I'm a freshman at Yale, and I was so I, you mentioned there's a difference between academic skill and practical skill. So I was wondering where do you learn most of your skills from? Because um, I want to make sure that um, I'm not I'm not just book smart, but yeah. able to my skill in real life as well. Yeah, so two ways for you as a freshman. One would be if you have the time and capacity to intern anywhere for nothing, you know, don't look for the money, but places would welcome you faster than you know to come in and be part of something that's important for them. And, and at your level and skill, don't, be a, don't come in to be another worker bee. Come in with some skill set that says, I'd like to learn more about, say, your finance group, but I'm also well-skilled in certain or I'm learning certain traits and I'd love to work with your CFO team and provide some support. So you have the right to invite yourself. The way to do that, you guys, is to pick an organization you are impressed with, call the HR leader, they're always visible, send a text or an email and just say, I would, I'm, I'm a student, my name is Vanessa Lee, I'm at, at, I'm, I'm at you know, at, at, did you say Harvard? You said Yale. Oh, yeah, yeah. I knew I was going to get it wrong, and that's a big deal. Sorry. I'm a student at Yale. I, I love Make-A-Wish. I have a friend who used to work there. Your offices aren't far from mine. I wonder if there's any opportunity for me to come in and intern, provide you guys some support at the same time, learn a little bit more about how your organization works. No one's going to say no to that if it's set up that way. Number one. Number two is in your class of your peers, literally seek out someone who's working in a job right now, like full-time or almost full-time or has worked um, in a job. And, and if there's anything you want a coffee stop with somebody, say, hey, Steven Sorensen, I see that you work currently at US Bank. I wanna know more about what it's like in the business culture. Can I buy you a cup of coffee before this course is over? He would probably love to talk to you about it. You will get the benefit of it. And coffee means, of course, virtually either way. But reach out to people. The best experience you can get at this stage is somebody else's if you can't get your first hand. But sitting back and just reading is very helpful, but that consumption will take you only so far. You can only read so much data, so much information, so much periodicals, and so much in class. 
But if you can get a little real world experience one way or another, it's going to be some of the best education you'll pick up. That's not rocket science, but it's a matter of prioritization to decide, do I really have the time? Do I really want to do that? And if you decide it's, it is, it could be some of the best education you give yourself. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hey, Richard, uh, Kevin here from Dartmouth. I'm the uh, co-founder and president of the chapter. Um, I gotta say, throughout this past few months, I've gotten to know Ross. He has never stopped saying high praises about you. So it's been an absolute honor to finally meet you in the city. And you know, I want to ask you um, actually about leadership. And back when you were talking with Mike earlier, you mentioned uh, building of trust and I have to infer relationships within yeah. business. And I was curious, especially at US Bank and also now at Make-A-Wish, now that you're operating at such a high level of leadership, um, what exactly does leadership mean to you? And for me personally, it's always been servitude uh, leadership, so serving others. I was yes. curious if you could speak a little more on that and your experiences. Well, you gave me two big ones, Kevin. One is servant leadership is beautiful because it's the most elegant of all leadership. It says, I, I lead at the service of others and together we serve better because we lead well, right? It's a wonderful right. cycle. So that's a excellent. I'm gonna give you another example just because um, I'm, that's how I think of my life. So when I joined Make-A-Wish a little over two years ago, Make-A-Wish has 59 chapters across the country uh, mm -hmm. covering the entire United States. Um, they did a big risk by bringing in a guy from for-profit business an old white guy of all things to run this organization. And I know that all the radars were up on the chapter CEOs of, I bet they brought him in to break the federated model. So what that means you guys is a lot of national not-for-profits are one 501 C3. They operate with one of everything and they manage it from headquarters. Make a wish and a number of others, probably 50-50 do it with, I have 60 501 C3s in my life the national office and 59 chapters. They have separate boards, separate leadership teams. And if you don't like, if you, if you love the federated model because you're independent, it's code for you're not the boss of me model. If you like the federated model because you appreciate the synergy of having the ability to be local, but have the power of the big brand, you've got it right. So I'm still answering your question, Kevin, because in my first, I don't know, couple of, meetings, I went out and did my test of the board members. I asked them what they wanted. I also talked to the chapter CEOs. And I just said, what do you want from me? And I asked them, what is the one thing you're afraid I'm going to do? I didn't used to ask that at the bank, but I asked it here. And these are one-on-ones. And I got this resounding, you're going to break the federated model. We all, we all think, or I think. So I said I wasn't, but I joined on January 2nd. And on March 3rd, we had our first summit of all the CEOs together and it was my 60th day. And I had a million things I wanted to say. I was so excited. I finally meet them. We get to get together and talk about stuff. I remember stepping up. It was a three step to the top of the stage. I walked across the stage. I said how honored I am to be here, how impressed I am to be here, how much I love what we do. And I said, let me say right off the bat, I'm not going to break the federated model as long as I'm here. And I've been told even today, the trust that that imbued was incredible because I didn't dance around it. I didn't right. get to it later. They didn't even know independently that everybody else had said what they said because I'm the only one who collected the data. Right. And of course, I didn't say it until I was sure I could mean it. But all that to say is trust is sometimes built on asking what it is people are concerned that would break the trust and to work hard to protect the thing that's, that, that they want you to protect, as opposed to trying to build it because you don't like me, because I'm funny, because it's I, I kind of hit the cord. Those are all good luck things, but sometimes building trust is to learn enough to find out what broken trust could look like, call it, promise that that's an understanding of yours that you share and that you won't break that trust, and then permission to move to, I'll call it more progressive trust. But does that make sense? Of course, yeah. And I guess throughout the process, you as a leader are also making yourself vulnerable, right? To, I guess. Touche. And in fact, in fact, I got to tell you, in the first few calls, I remember thinking, I was thinking about breaking the federal medal, by the way. And after this kept coming up, I thought, can I live with that decision? Because they knew more than I did. They eventually convinced me independently why it was smart. 
And then the last thing I said on that stage was, but here's the deal, you guys, we are getting the worst of it. We are not getting the best of the model. We don't share best practices. We don't trust each other. You don't have a relationship with it. We're going to get the best of it. And they're like, at that point, it's like, we'll give you anything you want. Just don't break the thing we care about. And so it has its benefits and risks, but I think bringing it forward and early imbues a sense that you listened, you were vulnerable, and you got at least, you got the point early that mattered to them the most. But it's backwards. Most people just try to earn the trust by being super cool and super good. Right. And that comes with time. Gotcha. I see. Awesome. Thank you so much for that yeah. insight. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate the question. Hi, Richard. Um, hey, Drew. My name's Drew. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm actually currently an employee at US Bank, so I'm going to ask you a little bit more. Hey, where's your pen? Yeah, that's right. One I'm just, yep, I was telling you. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> look, look what I brought to make a wish. We all wear pens every day, too, so you're not alone. <clears throat> I'm excited for us to get back in the office. I think the I think okay. the culture will come back. <laughs> yeah, it does matter. Yeah, that's right. Um. Anyways, um. I, actually, one one note. I was uh. I told my boss I I got to meet with you today, and he was really jealous. So you have a lot of it. raving fans still at US Bank. But um. Thank you. Anyways, I was just kind of curious. Um. When I talk with people who've been at the bank for quite a while, they say the biggest thing that they notice that you brought um becoming CEO is definitely a culture shift. Um, so I kind of want to know, you know, besides talking to the board, I'm sure that's something that maybe some of those members have brought up to you that wanted to change yep. around the bank. But um, besides yep. that, what are some of the steps you took to kind of build the strong culture we currently have at the bank? And then when you were leaving um, a few years back, what are some of the things that uh, you made sure to kind of discuss and rehash with Andy and other people, the management wow. team, to make sure that that culture remains after you leave? Wow, great questions. I'd promote you. <laughs> um, look, the, you know, the, the first thing is, so let's go to the last one first. Um, the permission I gave Andy was the board with my coaching after a number of years selected you to run the company. And I want you to change it. And I want you to know that we all want you to change it. So you are not replacing me. You are succeeding me. I am pretty self-aware at that point is 10 years. We desperately want this company to move to the next level. If there's anything you know about Andy, he's a technocrat. He's remarkably intelligent. And he thrives on all this new world of, of digital and um, uh, 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 transaction-based um, behaviors. I was great at certain things. That wasn't going to be my long suit. I knew it was coming. I could see it coming. It coincidentally happened in my same time, but we picked him for those reasons. And my point is I gave him permission to take some time to transition, but with intent, please transition. And I'll give you an example, Drew. If you've watched a, a um, baton handoff on a relay race, and if you watch it in slow motion, you guys know what happens is the runner that's about to take the baton starts to run to get to speed. And the runner with the baton starts running to catch them. And then they try to co coincide their speed at exactly the same time. The baton goes in from one hand to the other. And for as long as it seems forever, they hold it together. And so they're absolutely sure that by letting go, the baton will take. And so I was running up to him, asking him to start running and putting the baton in his hand as we had that conversation. And that's important because permission to change and move on is important because I was still the chairman of the board for the next year and he needed to know that he didn't have to wait for me to be gone a year because I wanted him to make changes. In fact, I would measure him on that. So hopefully that that gives you a, a little bit of a sense. Um, as it relates to culture, I teased it out at the very beginning. I really want to take a longer minute because and with Mike still here, he'll totally appreciate this. My predecessor was a very smart banker. Um, he and his brother, Jack, were both two of the greatest bankers um, in our time. And Jerry was his name. And Jerry would always talk about shareholders. That's all he talked about. Shareholders were everything. And he did well by the shareholders. They did well by him. But I remember that my easiest job taking over from Jerry was to flip the triangle or flip the, yeah, flip the pyramid. And I actually did this, like in my first few meetings. I actually, and Dan Spill, if he's still here, will remember. But instead of having the shareholders as the most important, and then the customers next most important, and the employees 
least important. They're all important enough, but flipping it around was easy and it wasn't self it wasn't um, patronizing, but I said, look, the employees are most important. They are the only way to the end. And if the employees are really, really engaged, motivated, and feel well cared for, only then will they be able to be remarkable in customer service. And I even said things like, I don't care if there's any more training on customer service for the rest of forever. Train it for skills, but you're not training for engagement or for commitment or for service leadership. You're, you, you need to train because people want to do well. And those customers will feel it if you do it better than the other guy. And then the customers being satisfied will create remarkable shareholder value. That's what Mike would measure us on. Every, how many new customers? How, how, what quality of your earnings? What's the future look like? So Drew, it was so simple because Jerry was so profoundly shareholder first, employee last, that flipping that triangle was actually a gift of gifts. I'll tell you how bad it was because I wanted my credibility. When we bought a bank in Milwaukee called First Star, um, Jerry was very big on lapel pins. This is so funny that this would come up again. Lapel pins, he couldn't have a big enough one. I remember there was a time Jerry wanted us to have a lapel pin the size of a half dollar. It was hilarious. And we all said, you know, first of all, you can't hold it up that long. People with pacemakers will lose their pacemaker and it's going to jump onto every piece of luggage in America. I say that because when we moved to First Star in Wisconsin, here's a Cincinnati bank. And gosh, Dan, if you remember this, Jerry asked the marketing people to stand at the elevator every morning for about a week and hand out lapel pins because the Wisconsin employees refused to wear the lapel pins. And it was just driving him nuts. And so the marketing team got baskets of, of lapel pins and they started telling us that late in the morning they would give the pin and as the elevator is closing, the employee would throw it back before the door closed and they were getting pummeled with lapel pins. And the point was mostly that I'll wear the lapel pin when you've earned what I need you to earn, that this matters, that I, this my life stands for this lapel pin. But we hadn't done that yet. We hadn't inculcated them. We hadn't told them why it matters to put their name next to it. And that was a real lesson for me to realize that you don't just adopt people or you don't merge people, you don't own people, you earn your way to them. And so it was very clear to me when I got to take over the reins, after the board confirmed that that was okay with them too, the shareholders will do better if the employees are treated better. But it was a little bit of a trip, a little bit of a risk, and I think it paid off handsomely. So find the thing. It's a little bit like my answer to Kevin. Find the thing you think could imbue the next level of trust or the next level of culture. If it's that clear and obvious, then set your sights on introducing that and let it be something that people celebrate and look forward to. I hope that makes sense. I hope you feel that way today because you're the most important part of that company. Certainly. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Drew, for the great question. And Richard, I've been thoroughly enjoying listening. I hope everyone else that's still on the line has been enjoying this too. Richard, before we started, you said it's important to start on time, even more important to end on time. I did um, say we that. have two and a half minutes left. So I want to throw you one last question, a bit of a layup question, and then I'll wrap us up. Um, okay. You joined the advisory board of Scholars of Finance recently, you joined our Alpha Fund. You're incredibly busy running a national organization on several boards. Why did you join? Why Scholars of Finance? Any parting words for all of us here in Scholars of Finance? Yeah, so I joined because I was there at the beginning, first of all. So when it was just a mere idea of yours and Ryan's and a few others, um, I said it earlier and I want to repeat it. The world needs to believe in the duty of businesses doing well. And we didn't spend what could have been an hour on social responsibilities and doing right by this community that we're all part of. But I can say that to know that people emerging into the finance world as leaders of the most trusted evidence of the quality of work done, believe that it has to be done well and done right. And it will always be transparent and it will be honest. There's, there's a credential that Business America hasn't had ever. And Scholars of Finance, I actually believe can be that. Besides being a beneficial benefit to each of you independently by the people you meet and by the place you can call one of your affinities, I think you're gonna find out that it's gonna stand for something much greater. And I'm looking at you, Mike, because I think it'd be appreciative, Ralph knows this, but we actually think there's a credentialing capability where on the next resume, when I find out that, you know, Rishi or Ridvik or Eugene 
are members of scholarship and finance. It means something to me, and I'm hiring them at a different level, and I'm expecting a different um, higher bar from them, and I want them in my organization so that they will influence and lead from every position. And so I could not be a bigger fan. I'm devoted to making it a bigger part of the fabric of American business. In the meantime, you guys are always going to be the first. You can only be the first once. You can only be the pioneers. And your responsibility is to tell this story widely, to put words around why it matters, not from your lens. So obvious to me why it's good for you, why it's good for the American business uh, construct that you're a part of, and why you believe so dearly that doing it well and doing it right matters. Um, that will help you. I think own it even at a higher level and advocate for it. And then as leaders, you will be part of this top of the pyramid as we build it out. And so I'm very excited to be part of it. And my wife, who's smarter than me, is even more excited to be a part of it because she knows this is right up uh, the alley of what business needs to have. And so congratulations for being a part of it, you guys, and lead well and lead loudly. Richard, thank you so much. It means it means the world to us. Um, really appreciate your belief in the mission and, and your leadership in the mission. Thank you so much for joining us. We are so grateful for you, inspired by all the incredible work you've done throughout your career for your support of SOF. Um, everyone, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and look forward to having you back soon. Thank you.